Hello everyone, happy Wednesday, not used to chatting to you on a Wednesday, normally it's a Friday, end of the week, but lovely, lovely to see you, please swipe in and say hi. We are very, very honoured to have a special guest today, um, I'm not going to be doing much of the talking, I'm going to hand over to, to Claire Upton, um, she, she was diagnosed with celiac disease a few years ago and she's going to share her story with us, she's done amazing things, she's written a book. Um, but I'm sure I'm not going to say too much here. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that Claire will will share her story with us. But please, if you've got any questions at all, pop them in the chat, and and we'll get to them towards the end or in the middle of a conversation. Um, I think Claire, are you happy just to sort of introduce what celiac is? It's quite it's quite relevant sort of this month because Celiac Awareness Day was on the 13th of September. Um, so we thought we'd take the opportunity to to get all the the stories and the expert advice from Claire. But Claire, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Well, on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me today. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was just, I, I just thought it would be a great opportunity to just share partly my journey, but just to bring awareness around celiac, given that I know overseas they say sort of um, celiac awareness is in May, but in, in South Africa, we celebrate in September on the 13th. Um, and, you know, in terms of what celiac is, to be honest, I don't go majorly into the medical part of, of what celiac is, other than when you eat gluten, it damages your villi and the small intestine. So what ends up happening is that you end up being un unable to absorb nutrients when you eat vitamin um, food, when you have supplements, you're just unable to absorb the goodness from food. So you end up getting quite malnourished. And what's very common with celiacs is that you are often anemic, lacking vitamin D, lacking vitamin B, and a whole host of other things. So by the time that you get to your, your diagnosis, you're just pretty malnourished more than, than anything else. Um, and I think I would say that actually getting to your diagnosis is probably the hardest part because you just don't know what's wrong with you. You just don't function at a, a normal level. Your your energy is just non-existent. And I was very lucky in that I was going for my fourth uh, iron infusion and somebody, the doctor actually said to me, has anybody asked or investigated why you'd be needing another iron infusion in such a short space of time? And I said, no. And they said, well, we would like you to go and have an endoscope and we can actually just go in there and see exactly what's happening, which I then did. And they could then see that all the villi were completely flattened out. So your villi are like the little hair like um, I don't know what you would call them, but they're little hair-like uh, features in your small intestine. And as the food passes over them, that's how your food is absorbed. Your, your nutrients are then absorbed through the villi. Yeah, and if they are all flattened and damaged, it. obviously you're not getting the same absorption. Mm. Exactly, it does. It looks exactly like little fingers or whatever. So so they, they were completely flattened. There was a lot of inflammation because obviously with celiac, you've got a lot of inflammation in your intestine. And... Yeah, it was just the hardest part was getting to the diagnosis because you just know that something's wrong with you and you're feeling so unwell. And yeah, I think that was probably the trickiest part. But in terms of even since being diagnosed, which is now about four years ago, I lose track of time, especially with COVID. Um, but, you know, even since diagnosis, I don't go into a lot of the websites to find out all the things that can happen to you and what it all, I just I kind of have focused on what it has meant for me personally and the, the the challenges that I've had and how can I correct those challenges? Because I think you can go down a bit of a bunny trail when you start get Googling everything. Absolutely. So that in terms of the medical, yeah, in terms of a medical part of it, I don't really um, go too heavily into that side. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, Okay, you know, in terms of once you've had the diagnosis, you think, okay, well, you're almost relieved because you know something's wrong and you understand now what it is and you think, okay, well, that just means cutting gluten out of my diet and that'll be fine. And to be honest, when I'd gone and done the scope, I had already been eating gluten-free for two months because I was seeing a dietitian and she said, just take gluten out your diet. Now, often when you go for those scopes, they say to you, it's very important that you eat gluten up until the point you have the scope. But nobody mentioned that to me, so I hadn't been. Well, I didn't think. Um, and the doctor said, well, you think you've been eating glu gluten-free, but you need to do some investigation. And oh my goodness, when you start investigating and finding out 
where the gluten is. I mean, it's in everything from, for example, spices. So eating out becomes impossible because unless a restaurant has specifically gone and got gluten-free spices, it's it's difficult for you to, to eat out. So that's a really a, a big challenge with eating out. But then it's in things, obviously, all the, we always think of the breads, pastas, cakes, biscuits, all of that type of thing. But it's very much in your cosmetics. It's in toothpaste. It's in... Um, even those those paper straws that they're now doing, which is fantastic for the environment, but the glue in those straws has got gluten in it. And I didn't know that. And I was having smoothies the one time when I was on a three week work stint, and I had a smoothie for lunch every day because I thought, well, that's safe. And I was having it with those straws. And after three weeks, I was in such agony. And then I got a post from our celiac group, which which I'm on in South Africa, and they just said, guys, be careful of those straws because the glue in in those straws has gluten in it. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's what it is. It's been making me so ill. So. Sometimes gluten just pops up in the weirdest places that you just would never even think of. So when it comes to cutting gluten out of your diet, it's not just take out the pasta and the bread and the biscuits, yeah. etc. It's actually, it's it's so much bigger, bigger than that. Um, I think also just setting up, yes, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, sorry to jump in. Yeah. I think it's a delay with, without speaking here. But if I can jump in there, I think also there's, there's a difference sure. between somebody who's, Sort of they're, they're gluten intolerant versus celiac. Celiac is proper allergy to to gluten, whereas somebody who's gluten intolerant can maybe Correct. get away with a small dose of gluten, but they've got to watch how much they have. And I think that's yes. where the big difference lies. So somebody who's gluten intolerant wouldn't be affected by by, by the paper straw, for example, because the amount would be minuscule. But because you're exactly allergic to it, exactly that tiny minuscule amount can have yeah you know, catastrophic effects for you. It's very much like that. Yeah. And I think the the gluten, you know, when you, I, I also really feel for people who have got gluten intolerance because I think your lifestyle changes just as much because you still need to try and avoid the gluten, but not to the same level, like you say. But the difference is that when you do have gluten as a celiac is that it's actually damaging and destroying your small intestine, whereas it's making you uncomfortable, but extremely so for gluten intolerance. So, I mean, some people really struggle with that as well. But yes, it's almost like an allergy to gluten as opposed to an intolerance to gluten would be, I would say, was, would be the simplest way to explain the difference. And I think also you mentioned earlier sort of that, that to get to a diagnosis, it, it's quite a few steps and it takes a while. And I think the reason for that is it's not going to be the front of mind um, diagnosis that many doctors are going to think of because the stats show about 1% of people have celiac disease. So it's not, it's not yes. going to be one of those common, common diseases that you'd look out for automatically. Um, and I think often they yes. just sort of the Absolutely. end up treating the symptoms, for example, anemia, giving you iron infusions, and they, they miss miss the reality sort of what's actually yeah. causing it and your personal absolutely because i mean those story, symptoms yeah i was just going to say sort of over what period of time did the diagnosis happen so you it sounded like you you were oh. suffering with symptoms for ages for ages. I mean, I remember actually when I left home, so I left home when I was 16 because I, I actually um, did my schooling, started school in Zimbabwe. So I started school young. Um, so I finished my schooling when I was 16, turned in 17, and then I went to college. And I've, I've been vegetarian for sort of 34 years pr prior to the last couple of years. Um, but when you go to college and you're vegetarian, all they do is they feed you pasta and breads and everything. So I started then to, I think I was extremely anemic because, well, I don't know, maybe a little bit of the partying and everything else too. But I used to just sleep through my lectures and I was just absolutely exhausted. So I think then is when my health actually started to deteriorate and probably having my mom's cooking and that up until that time was a huge help because we didn't eat a lot of breads and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was literally from the time I was 17 until like, so my early 40s was when I was diagnosed. And I remember watching this mom playing in the park with her, her child many years ago. And I thought, oh, I just want that vitality. Like, I, I just would love to not feel like I'm walking through some mental day, you know, and I always used to be blown away. People didn't work out. How can I actually take some time out in the day to sleep? Because how can you get through a day without needing to sleep? Because like I, I was just exhausted, absolutely exhausted. So it, it was many, many, many years of really just living life at what I felt like was a 60% full tank, you know, and whereas now, and I think that's why I also want to do, you know, talk to you is that 
I live a life now way like more full of vitality and more full than I did, you know, before my diagnosis. So being diagnosed with celiacs is not the sentence of, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with my life from here on out? It's actually a gift because it's kind of like beyond that gate of where all the snacks and the treats and everything are that we've always loved and wanted in our life is there's a gate that kind of goes, you can't go there anymore. And in that is the gift because you generally just eat so much healthier, you know, than you did before. But that is like I say, layers of an onion, because when you first diagnose, the first thing you do is you go and try and replace all of your goodies with, um, you know, your gluten-free options. So your gluten-free biscuits and your gluten-free chips and everything, but they are just loaded with sugar, first of all, and often have soy and corn in them. And one of the other challenges with celiac is often in the beginning, you need to just heal your gut before you can start to introduce all different food types. So it's quite common to have um, intolerance with dairy, with um, corn and soy. And I think corn and soy, because they're so often genetically modified, that that's why that is uh, such a challenge. So it takes a long time to, to heal before you can start introducing those. But when you try and introduce all these treats and snacks and everything, and they've got soy and corn in it, you actually end up feeling as bad as you did when you were eating gluten. Yeah. So slowly you peel back the layers and you have a few tantrums along the way and tears mm -hmm. and everything else. And you get to a place where you just move closer and closer to whole foods. And actually Whole30 was a great book that I picked up and, and or way of eating that I came across, which is kind of like an elimination diet where you just eliminate a number of, of different foods and then you start adding those back in slowly. So you you help yourself to heal, you help yourself to see exactly which foods are triggering the problems and also you then start, when you introduce them back again, you can then start to um, see which foods are really causing a problem for you. And dairy was one definitely for me that I've only been able to introduce in the last sort of six months. And then doing Jeff, I've been having a lot more dairy and it's actually been okay. But I just sort of stick more to the lactose free and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. Which is absolutely fantastic. And I think that there's such an important message there as well is the fact that just because you potentially can't tolerate foods right now, here and now because your 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 gut is inflamed and, and you're not absorbing yes. nutrients like you should it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to down the line you need to sort of allow your gut to repair to recover and then slowly start yes. reintroducing some foods that you couldn't tolerate before because there are a lot of foods there that actually for example like dairy is a fantastic source of protein source of calcium so you don't want to just eliminate without reintroducing um and that's yes. yeah i'm so glad that you are i mean it must be a new lease on life being able to tolerate dairy now as well there's a lot of items there that you would have missed i'm sure Definitely. Well, actually, that's how I ended up on Jeff, because as I healed, and like I said, in the last six months, is it just, I felt like I was a kid in a toy shop again, because introduce some dairy back into your diet, and even a little bit of corn and soy and things like that, you know, if it was in products, I would still be able to have that. And I was like, oh, it's like a whole new world, you know, and I just started to eat so many, and too much junk, actually, all those processed foods that I'd been avoiding, yeah. and I just started to put on more and more weight and throw in perimenopause and, and, and. Mm -hmm. And, and I was like, okay, I need to do something. <laughs> yeah. And also to say that it's possible, even being gluten free and having celiac, that it's possible to do Jeff, you know, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of the time a celiac would look at programs like this and go, oh, well, I won't be able to do it. And I think the only thing that was quite challenging in the beginning for me is instead of just being able to take your menu and just work with the menu that you provide and slowly get your head around actually how the portion sizes work, et cetera, I really needed to like delve in and and work out how your proteins worked and your, you know, yeah. how start what, what meant to start. And then I, I printed out some recipes that I knew that I would be able to use. And then I designed my own menu so that... That first little bit was quite tricky. Yes. And you know what? We want you to go through that. We do we do that on purpose. So we when we okay. do your weekly menu, especially new clients, it's there to inspire you, to give you some ideas. But we would never ever expect that everybody's gonna like every item on the menu, because that's that's just not yes. gonna happen. I mean, there's often items I like, oh no, thank you. But the idea is just to sort of help you the first few steps. And then as coaches, we want to see that you actually understand what a starch is, what a protein, what a fat is how to combine, and that's why we ask for all those pretty photos as well, so we can see that okay. if you need to combine the proteins, fats, and, and starch, that you're doing it in the right quantities, and that you understand 
what what a starch is, like I said, and what what a protein is. And I yeah. think that's a journey that you need to go through. And that's your, your coach is, is. is testing you a lot of the time. But the idea is that when, <laughs> when you leave, because we're not going to be together as, as coach and client forever. The idea is that sure. we want you to be able to leave and know exactly what you're doing, almost be able to start your own dietitian practice. <laughs> we want it at that level. No, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. So it's, no, it's, I get it's, that. It's to, to test you and and make sure that when you do see a recipe, you can look at the ingredients and you say, oh, you know what? It's got enough protein, it's got enough enough fat and starch. So it sounds like you've done that journey beautifully well and more. <laughs> <laughs> oh well it's good to know that it's meant to be a little bit painful not painful but in the beginning it's so confusing so it is a little bit hard you know, to get your head yeah. around yeah no but absolutely yeah. but but there's a yeah bit of method behind the madness um we're not trying to make you suffer obviously and different different people at different levels so some some people would need a little bit sure of but do the work no absolutely yeah the, 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 yeah, the message there is you've got to do some work um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Rather, yeah. rather than the fish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think also, you know, I, I, and another reason I also wanted to chat is just to help friends and family understand celiacs. Because when you do come into this, you'd get so many different reactions from friends and family. And just to give you an idea of what it takes in my own home, I mean, we have gluten completely separate. It's not in the kitchen. You have a, a, a like a sideboard in the dining room, and that's where all the bread is cut. We've got specific knives and that for that. We've got a specific pot if I do cook pasta with a specific colander because pasta is so hard to wash out of a colander, for example. So I don't want to have to keep on like scrubbing all my things down I we've got it very much down packed that I know what my chopping board is and there's a bread chopping board and it's not even in the kitchen and you know I've, I've sourced all of the right spices I've done all of the work so friends and family are often so well-meaning and they're like oh, I'll cook your meal or we'll find you a restaurant where you can eat don't worry about it but it is in the beginning it is so stressful to leave your home without food in a bag that you know you've made and you know is safe for you to eat i can't tell you the fear like it's even looking back cuz i you know as you, as you mentioned i wrote a book just just on the journey of it and it's a really short book but it's just starting from the beginning of the journey and i read back to that and i was like wow that fear is so real you know and it gets so much better but I just think that you've done so much in your own home to prepare your food safely that when a friend or family member says, Anna, please let me cook for you, and then you walk into their house and you finally said, okay, that's fine. I remember one specific occasion and um, and somebody had made me these steamed veggies for lunch and they said, oh, and I made a birthday cake for your husband. Mm -hmm. and. And flour, like I will not have gluten flour in my home because flour you cannot contain. So immediately, like the stress level of, oh my gosh, how am I going to eat those veggies now? So you just, it's so much easier for me to bring my own food. And the friends mm -hmm. and family that just allow me to bring my own food, I just can't thank them enough because it takes out so much stress. I don't like to eat out in restaurants and things like that because, again, you don't know what's happened to your food. Is it the right spices? Is their bread right next to where they prepared your gluten-free you know, meal? Did they use a chopping board that didn't just have bread on it? It's just mm -hmm. endless things. And, and I've got to have place now. I mean, off the gluten path in Woodstock is phenomenal. It's run by a celiac, um, Bronwyn and Stephanie. And Stephanie's also got food intolerances and that. And they just get it, you know. I mean, you can walk in there. The first time I went in there, I just cried because I was like, oh, the choice. I can have so many different things from here. So you find places that you feel safe. And, I mean, often it's more on the pricier side as well because they're prepared to take care with your food and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just eating out, eating with friends and family. For me personally, I just love to bring my own. Others in the celiac group, they're like, I absolutely, I won't go somewhere if they can't prepare food for me because I don't want to take my own. I want the break, you know. So yeah. everybody's different in how they handle it. But for me personally, I just am like, please just let me take my own. I know that it's cooked well, you know, it's cooked in a way that I need it to be. And Absolutely. yeah, that's that's much and I easier. Imagine for me. That your family and friends are quite relieved as well, because that's quite a responsibility, actually. Um yes. to make sure that, that everything is is hundred percent gluten free. Like you say, the flour, I mean in our kitchen with my girls, <laughs> when they're baking, there's flour everywhere, literally everywhere, places you never thought yeah. possible. So just for that reason. Exactly. Alone, yeah, there's a, there's a risk. Yeah, but, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your support group um, in Cape Town. You, you yes, yeah, so 
Yeah, so we've got a group. It started with just three of us. In fact, it was um, uh, Sebastian who actually started the group. And and it's now about 35 of us. And we're just on a WhatsApp group. And we've also got um, Diane on the group who is the Allergen Gluten Bakery. And she is amazing because we'll often just say, oh, I'm desperate for this. Is this okay for me to eat? And she's so like knowledgeable about food and everything that she's a great go-to in our group. So mm -hmm. it's a fantastic group. It really is open to anyone. So if anybody wanted to join the group, they could just send me their, their number and we could add you to that group. We get together. I mean, like I said, in, um, we got together this month for Celiac Awareness Day or whatever it was in South Africa. Um, but with COVID, we haven't got together as much. Mm -hmm. But it's just great to go out with people that just get it. And we do it all so differently. I mean, I prefer to eat most of the whole foods and healthier foods. Others are baking every day. Others are living on soy products. Everybody's in different levels of pain. So it's also yeah. quite interesting to see yeah. what are the implications of how differently people are eating. But we all just there to support each other's journey. It's not, you know, we all work in our own way. We're not there to tell each other, well, maybe try this or maybe try that. We're so over, you know, all of that. We just go and just hang out together every now and again. But otherwise, we're on the WhatsApp group asking questions. We've got new people joining all the time and just giving them support because the hardest, hardest time is in the beginning. You know, I'm now three, four years down the line and it really is just a way of life. It's not it's not overwhelming or daunting. Other than travel is, is sometimes tricky as well. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's just so much better. So that group's amazing. And anybody is welcome to just be added onto that group as well. But just imagine as a newly diagnosed celiac, I mean, you need that. Yes, you need advice from your doctor and you need the literature, but what you actually really need is support of people who are in the same boat as you. Um, yes. Yeah, I think that that is incredible. And it's almost, I, I just wish that every doctor who works with celiac patients, celiac clients, that they, they that's sort of the yeah. person who can give advice on, on meds and, and food. But you need to actually, for me, that's number one priority is just, Yes. Get into a group with, with people who have have had exactly the same experience as you. But just yeah, on, on the line, you said different levels, different degrees of pain. So in terms of your own situation, is I mean you well manage. You you I'm assuming that you the pain very and, much so. Okay. I have very, very Pain. But uh, in the beginning, I thought, well, not in the beginning, before I was diagnosed, I kind of would, you know, I'd have meetings or whatever for work and I'd have to go and lie on the bathroom floor because I was in so much pain you know just you know anywhere that you ate other food or what it, I don't know what it was but it was just I thought it was normal to just be in that much pain you know so you just now I realize well it's absolutely not and if I do have something that does trigger pain or whatever it takes up to three months to get your stomach you know sure. right again so yeah. It, it, yeah yeah it isn't just that yeah. oh well I had that yeah, by mistake, and I'll be fine in a couple of days. It really takes a long time to get your stomach back to where it is. So that's, again, why you're like, thank you so much, everybody, for being so willing to help me, but please let me just do this on my own because I don't want to go through that, you know. So. And yeah. another question. I'm asking all my questions. I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. So I'm just yeah, go for it. Um, do you find that still today there are new food items? That, that you actually find that contain gluten where you didn't think they would? Um, are they, is it a constant learning yes. process through experience? It is. It is. And, and, you know, it's not even like you can say, okay, great, I can have almond nuts because you actually yes. have to check. It's where the almond nuts have come from. So, for example, I know a place where I know I can't eat the almond nuts because they also do, you know, sort of coated nuts, which are mm -hmm. done on conveyor belts. So my nuts will go down the same conveyor belt and often they end up being cross-contaminated. So you eventually even find, so it's not even, you find the certain products that you can have, but then you also realize that it's also the certain brands that you would rather stick to and rather stay away from. So it really is an ongoing journey all the time that you, you're finding new products, new, new brands. And the exciting thing is that you're also finding new products that you can eat. So oh, yeah. that also gets it's exciting. Right. And, and yeah, and my family are amazing. I mean, my son gets more excited about a new food that I can eat than I yeah. do. Like, he's really yeah. sweet. <laughs> oh, and of course, he wants some as well. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, no. He's just, no. no, he's just so excited that there's oh, actually a new definitely. food, you know. Like, it's, it really is exciting, yeah. I mean, when I started to introduce dairy back into my food, and I could actually have, like, a even, like, the Jeff muffins, you know, with cheese mm. in those muffins. I mean, cheese is just such a... 
it's just such a comforting food, you know. Mm. So to have that taken out for a long time, take out gluten, dairy, soy, and corn. And I promise you, you just like go, oh, my goodness. And that's why I also said I was vegetarian for 34 years, but I did reintroduce, I tried to introduce meat again, and I just couldn't stomach it. So I do have fish once a week just to try and up my protein, you know, sort of from a, a animal source as well. But yeah. just because I was so lacking in, in the options that I had to eat. But, yeah, no, it's... Um, yeah. <laughs> that's also for me, that's why it's so important to have that community, to have that support group, because everybody's going to find out something new every few days and just share it rather than everyone having to yes. sort of take more years to figure out what foods they can and can't eat, what brands they exactly. can and can't eat. I mean, that, for me, that's massive. It's really, really massive. Yeah, yeah. No, it does. It saves you a lot of time and effort and pain, you know. So you just immediately told, actually, just stay away from this brand. We're having problems with it. And we just do, yeah. you know. So oh, yeah. and South Africa is South Africa is not well regulated. So even when products say that they're naturally gluten free, you know, they're generally quite good about saying that it's made in a factory with gluten. Some people will even still eat some of those products because if you had to only rely on gluten free products, you know, that are certified gluten free in South Africa, there's very few. It's just not well regulated. And we've actually in that group started the Celiac Association of South Africa, which we're just in the process of starting. And I think the aim there is to get to a space where we actually work through certifying you know gluten-free products yeah, as opposed to just being you know people saying oh well this is naturally gluten-free or whatever yeah. wording they like to use yeah no yeah. it's fantastic and i think a lot of people a lot of sort of marketing and brands have jumped on a, a bit of a bandwagon where gluten-free is associated with good health um and and so yes. if, if you put gluten-free on your product even though it's got the biggest amount of sugar and an incredibly processed Cute. um yeah, then, then you sort yeah. of, oh, it's a health product. And I think that's that's something that, that people need to also be aware of, is that just because something's gluten-free yeah. doesn't mean it's healthier than an alternative option. And I think you alluded to that Definitely. earlier as well. Um, always want to still stick to the foods, um, the real stuff, the real foods, basically, as far as possible. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's great about Jeff again, because, you know, you, you're you just going back to, like a lot of it is similar to how I've had to live because I've been having to make my own meals for so long, which is actually one of the biggest challenges I think people come when they start doing Jeff is to put that time into the kitchen. I do not like cooking. Like I would rather draw up a spreadsheet than cook. Like it's just not my favorite thing. But I spend so much time that I just have to do it anyway. So Jeff has just helped me kind of get back to more of the whole foods. As I said, when I went off the rails, when I started introducing all the the dairy, which opened up a whole lot more doors, yeah. like yeah. like air, Aero chocolate is gluten free. <laughs> That's the other thing, chocolates. You won't believe like how many little hidden ones are actually gluten free, and uh, you know yeah. so many of them aren't. So. But yeah, so it, Jeff has been amazing like that. And it really is along the lines of healthy eating and good meals and making your own meals and making sure that they're nutritious. So it's very much in line with what you need to do as a celiac anyway. Mm -hmm. It just has been great to have a few new recipes and new ideas and everything as well. So that's been fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think they're just the message as well is that it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't need to spend two hours in the kitchen prepping your meal. Um, yeah. Yes. As long as you're using whole foods, it can be simple and you can, yeah, you can get a really good meal out in half an hour. I think often people, yes. people feel that to make a good nutritious meal, you've got to be cooking there for like two, three hours. And that's just not the case. Yeah. Well, so. Yeah. For no, people, no. Yeah. For Absolutely. Don't like cooking or just don't have time to cook. And that, that's also often yes. the case. You love cooking, but yeah, you only have half yes. an hour. Yes. No, exactly. So. Exactly. And, and I must say, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're running out of bit of time, but do you want to just sort of mention your book and where where you can access your book? And um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I started reading it on the long weekend, and actually, <laughs> um, so I think that would be it's actually. Yeah, Shane, that's sort of you. I mean, it really, I, do, I always feel like I need to say it's just a little book. I mean, it's just really a document of my time, like working through this whole journey and working my, my head, getting my head around it all and everything. But I've put it on Kindle so you can get it on Kindle, Amazon.com. And it's called Celiacs, the Good, the Bad and the Reality. And yeah, it really is. It's it's. I've put it on free. So you, if you've got Kindle Unlimited, it's free. And at the moment, I've just put it on like it's one dollar something. Otherwise, they normally sell it at about seven dollars. But yeah, it really is just a, a real life account of how I've how I've set up my home, how I travel with this, how I, 
you know, just it, traveling is another huge thing, you know, getting on a long haul flight, just covering all those kind of topics, weddings, social occasions, mm -hmm. eating out in a restaurant, how to handle all of those different things. So I've just sort of documented my way of doing it. But like I say, it literally is one of like many different ways of, of living a celiac journey, you know, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to document it for myself as well as to help people because in the beginning, it's so overwhelming and so daunting. So, yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not celiac, but I was almost comforted by the book and it, you just, you speak in such a nice, real way as well. There's no sort of, oh, yeah, thank you. You, you, you're speaking the truth and you can pick up on that and it's, it's you, you speak yes. your real experience um, which is lovely. And it's sure. Refreshing. I would highly recommend that, that whether you see that or not, that you actually read it. It's, it's really, really Thank a, you. Good, a good read. Yeah. But I think Thank our time is up. Um, we haven't got any specific questions that have come through, but I'm sure there's a lot of food for thought. And, and definitely, if you've got any questions or you know somebody who might have questions, I can definitely put you in contact with Claire if she's happy with that. Absolutely. Um, afterwards. But Claire, thank you so much for your time. Really, really it's appreciate such a pleasure. it. Yeah, it's I know you've been like so a wonder woman, but but I really do think you are. I think yeah, you've been great <laughs> journey incredibly well. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been lovely to chat. And yeah, I just hope it helps people. That's the main thing. Yeah, definitely well, I'm quite sure. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.